And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two of my good brothers here in the temple. We have the me we have the man oh, the man who ha who is truly rocking a pair of pre a pair of cheap sunglasses. And the and the and the man who will and the man who is the only one in this room who can style and profile. Good brother JT. And we have that's, that's, the CEO the, way, baby. <laughs> the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, the man of a thousand runes, and the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Xanatrix. It is July eleventh. How the fuck we doing tonight? Ain't nothing but a dandy thing, baby. <laughs> I am uh, once again spending money recklessly in R and D, but this time it's for giant robots, so we're all good. <laughs> uh, giant robots appreciate in value over time, so that's an investment. Mm. Oh. And uh, and uh, hell, if um if we're, if um if Yokohama is gonna get is gonna get its own Gundam factory, why not? <laughs> hmm, might have to might have to contract with them. See if they can build my models too. Nice. Um, also, hey General Motors, where's my goddamn fusion generator? <laughs> <laughs> and... That'd solve that solve your energy crisis right there. <laughs> also, also, um, where where's the blackjack? <laughs> oh. Don't worry. Don't worry. One of the one of these days, I will. Do, one of these days, as soon as I figure out how I do it, I will do a Mech Warrior focused ep focused episode. Um, cool. Do you really want to sink into that mire? I'm already. I'm already deep. I'm already deep into it as it is. Yeah, our funeral then, I suppose. Uh. Um, at the very at the very least, at the very least, it'll pro it'll probably be me. T it'll probably be me talking about how how much I hate Capellans. Because everybody hates Capellans. Even Cap even other Capellans hate Capellans. No, I, I'm pretty sure that you will inundate that uh that entire episode with uh, how Steiner memes. I c I could, but it would just it would just be the same it would just be the same meme. You ever seen a Steiner Scout Lance? <laughs> <laughs> All right, but today we are not here for Mecha Monk. What are we here for? No. Today, very good question. It is. It has been. It has been quite some time since we picked on somebody from Hollyweird, and while we may make few, a few jabs when it, whenever we do reconstructions, whenever they fuck up on something, which to be fair is a lot, especially these days. But there is a certain low hanging. F I wanted to do another one of those, and there is a certain low hanging fruit that is an isn't an, would seem an easy target, but I want to. Oh, but the descent of this man is something that is endlessly fascinating to me. Fascinating indeed. Because for this week we have M. Night Shyamalan from Maestro to Meme. What a twist. <laughs> what a twist. What a twist. Exactly. You yeah, know, well, we got that out of the way, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> and don't... And, We'll, pro we'll probably we'll probably ex use this as an ex as an excuse to talk about the right and wrong way to do a to do a twist, but we're, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. We are getting ahead of ourselves. There's there's one thing I gotta say, um, and that's if anyone anywhere bitches about spoilers, fuck you. <laughs> a lot of them, a lot of the movies we'll be talking about are several years old, and the stat the statute has run out. Also, you cannot spoil what is already rotten. <laughs> oh, dude, dude, that's like profound, man. <laughs> but about as deep as a puddle. <laughs> <laughs> but the but it is it is endless. I ended up looking through old ass our old ass articles and newspaper clippings when this when people were just finding out about the sixth sense. And 
what I what I find endlessly amusing is pe is people sing is people singing the praises of e of M Night Shyam of M Night Shyamalan, seeing old ads where that where that was put front and center on TV ads for his wor for his works, and people unironically claiming that the that the next great great auteur name in 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 Hollywood filmmaking had been discovered. As a spoiler for the Sixth Sense. Bruce Willis kills Emperor Palpatine by throwing him into Mount Doom. <laughs> oh, I, I had to do that joke. That was that was <laughs> it was right there. The opportunity was unmistakable. Yeah. Obvious obviously the big the big thing that the the big the biggest boon and ba and bane has been has been the use of has been the use of a twist ending. Um and we'll get we'll get to that, but the point is, after we'll the that. after that came unbre came Unbreakable, which I know people have a divided opinion on. I I honestly didn't mind it. Um, In that one, Bruce Willis becomes a god by being unkillable. Um, <laughs> and that and then we had then we had then we had Signs, which may, which may have been the canary in the coal mine. I mean, Signs was all right, but the but the the whole thing of oh the alien is is weak to water. Then why the fuck did they go to a planet that's seventy five percent water? Oh no no! You see this this movie signs this one here. Uh, this was just Mel Gibson uh, being himself. <laughs> um, because the, impl the implication when you hear the radio broadcast at the end of the uh, of the movie is that the first people who discovered the aliens were weak to water were some shepherds. Living in a Middle Eastern desert, what? and they were, and the entire movie, they were always referring to the little girl, the, the daughter, as a as an angel sent by God, and she was always leaving water everywhere. So it's it's really supposed to be holy water. Damn it, just the aliens. Uh, they're actually demons. There's it's rhetorical. There's stretch. There's stretching interpretations. And then there's having Reed Richards drawn and quartered. I don't know. This one just seems more like Goatsy than anything. <laughs> We're not here to talk about the end gauge. So the oh, first time you've tried to murder me, Monk, and it'll certainly not be the last, but thank although, you. <laughs> when I was doing research, I ended up finding out that Signs was at the crux of a plagiarism accusation. Interesting. At both Signs and The Sixth Sense. Um, in t Quoth, Quoth, Quoth the Wiki, in 2003, a Pennsylvanian screenwriter named Robic... Robert McElhenney, no relation to the to um, Rob McElhenney, creator of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, sued Shyamalan, alleging similarities between Signs and his unpublished script Lord of the Barons: The Jersey Devil. Um, and both both Signs has got Signs has gotten this accusation. The Village got this accusation. Um, the Sixth Sense got this got this accusation. Although um, although when it came to the Sixth Sense. The person who was crying foul about that was Orson Scott Card, but he he said that enough had been changed that there was no point in suing. Um. But when it can't, but um, with those three films that se that seemed to be that seemed to be um, even though even though some of them even though there was a gradual shakiness, it seemed it did it didn't seem like things were go were going to be um were going to be all that bad at work. At worst, you'd at worst you'd see, you'd see people um. T you'd see people take take it take it and say, and say that it say that he's becoming mediocre. But th but then <laughs> it just goes right down the fucking toilet. I mean, hoi hoi hoi. The vi the village a lot of, a lot of people dis a lot of people. Disliked, I I remember I remember finding it kind of quaint simply be, simply because of of oh, of the fact that I that I that um where I come where I come from everybody more or less knows about the about the Amish community and they'll 
occasionally sh they'll occasionally show up um, from time to time. I honestly don't didn't mind. The, I honestly didn't mind the village. Um, I thought it had some nice atmosphere when you know the monster when you know they had you know the monsters in the woods and you know the whole uh, maze on scene with uh, all the red flowers and stuff during the uh, the intense uh, during the uh, the scary parts. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a nice bit. Was a nice bit of uh, was a nice bit of uh, cinemato cinematography. Uh, the twist isn't much of a twist, to be honest. I don't take, but I don't feel like, but I feel like it's a more. It's not really meant as a twist. It's more of a uh, revel revelation as to and uh, what it says about um, isolationist society, isolationary societies mm -hmm. that um, that uh, reject uh, the outside world and uh, what that does to people who live in those societies and stuff like that. Um, I thought, I, I, which, which I found actually kind of profound. I, I took something away from that, to be uh, to be honest. And uh, like I said, I thought the aesthetic of the of the village was pretty cool. It reminded me a lot of the the uh, the first part, the first third of Resident Resident Evil Four. It kind of had it kind of had that vibe going for it. And anything that reminds me of Resident Evil Four is not a bad thing. Uh, in in other words, the village. Was an was a rejection of the statement, reject modernity, embrace tradition, and instead is a an embracer because this would be easier to reject modernity and return to monkey. <laughs> okay, sure, why not? Because <laughs> they only went back to tradition and things went very badly. If they had gone back to monkey, they would have been fine. <laughs> But and it, and it, I get the I, but then Lady in the Water happened. <laughs> oh boy! Uh, <laughs> not not even Paul Giamatti, the fantastic actor that he is, could save it. Huh. Which, if Paul Giamatti can't help you, then save us, Paul Giamatti! I can't. We're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> If if Paul Giamatti can't do can't do anything for, can't do anything with you, um, then you then you are f then you're fucked. I mean, not to not to mention it feels like they really restricted some of his better um, aspects, some of the better things he pulls off in his roles for that role. They they made him very subdued mm -hmm. in Lady mm -hmm. in the Water, mm -hmm. and even even in roles where he's playing someone who isn't like shouting all the time like if we go to his role as <clears throat> chief inspector in uh the illusionist he's fairly quiet and straight talking in most of the scenes except for the scenes where he has to make announcements to large crowds in which case you know you have to raise your voice anyway but <clears throat> he's always intense he's always got this this sense of purpose and focus and intensity and it always brings this uh this really good sense of of Paul Giamatti's acting chops into the scene, uh, even as he's getting the reveal at the very end of the movie, and that's a movie I won't spoil because I really the illusionist is something that should be uh, experienced by everyone. Mm. You know, that's I've the had, illusionist. You know, I've had I've, I've had that movie in my. Uh... I bought that movie when a blockbuster closed down, and I've just had it in my uh, cabinet uh, for years, and I never watched it. And uh, so, but, thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> yeah, e even even with the reveal at the end, he's not very intense. Um, but the sheer amount of emotion that crosses his face of shock and wonder, and like both the realization of "ha, even I was tricked," and then "bravo." Uh, it's just the best. You watch it all cross his face in a matter of seconds, hmm. and you're like, Jamati, you knew the ending of this movie before your character did. And the fact that you could make it seem like even you yourself, not the character, but you yourself, didn't predict that ending? Masters. Hmm. And the fact that he could not do that, and I believe part of it was probably the direct, the, the, the casting director saying you, you have to act in a specific way. Um, for Lady in the Water, it, it is much to its detriment. 
if he had been allowed to bring the full the full force of of the way he brings an emotional uh, part into play, it could have been better. Now, yeah. would, would that have saved it? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes. But of of course, the more infamous thing that that everybody's gonna remember um, Lady in the Water for is to is two things. One, um, having a straw man version of a critic get killed by the monster, which was <laughs> which was just really bad form. And two, casting him casting himself in the movie. Well, he's cast himself in his other movies. He did it in Signs. Mm -hmm. He also, I think he had a bit, a bit in a, even in the Sixth Sense, didn't he? And like a tiny bit appearance. I do want, I do want to, I do want he was, to. He was, he, he was the forest ranger at the end of the village. Yeah, I do want to, I do want to clarify that, clarify that a bit. Um, directors or directors, writers, producers of like, um, putting them, putting themselves into into the work, is nothing necessarily new. But if you look at a lot of the times it's done, it's usually a minor character or a backdrop or um or some or some sort of Easter egg, like Tarantino in most of his movies. Yeah, but you'd were they're there for uh, they're there for a scene and that and that's it. But as I recall, when it came to Lady in the Water, he put himself in a much more significant role. It's been now. Granted, it, granted, it has been it has been a while, but I do I do remember the fact that he that um the amount of screen time that he ended up getting felt it was um a little bit unearned, especially since he's especially since um he's not he's obviously not very good of an actor, but he but he doesn't ha he doesn't have the he doesn't have the gumption to just go full force with it like say. Tarantino d did in um, Pulp Fiction during the coffee scene. <laughs> uh, yeah, but Tarantino also, like he he knows where his strengths lie, and so he only gives himself the part that he knows will fit. It's it's more of a thing of he's not going to do anything that he knows he can't. Mm -hmm. So. When it comes so when it comes to his spe when it comes to his speaking, yeah, it sucks, especially the whole especially the whole storage bit, but he could do it. Mm -hmm. Whereas with whereas Shyamalan was tr was trying to do serious actor and it ju and um it just ends up being sad. Yeah. In science, he limited himself to like one set of lines mm -hmm. and it was when Gibson's character finds him and he's already in his truck and he's about to drive down to the lake mm -hmm. it, it's just a, a small monologue in this case technically a dialogue even though Gibson's character wasn't responding he was just talking about how guilty he felt at accidentally killing Gibson's character's wife mm -hmm. and then how he trapped that thing inside his house and that they kind of don't seem to like water though he doesn't know why so he's going to go down to the lake mm -hmm. and when it when it comes but um and, the, and of course beca of course because of that the the um you look at you look at these you look at the setup and there's a, and there's a sh there's a sharp sharp um no um nose dive like the village has a as a medic as a um as a rotten tomatoes i know i know i know but this was pre breaking of rotten tomatoes so i think we can utilize it of um of for, of um 40 i'll go with science science has 74% of 234 reviews the village has 43% of 218 Lady in the Water has 25 of 212, and then we get to the bit to the bigger nadir in the happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, how how yeah. do you fuck up the happening? It's about a it's about a it's about a poisonous gas that makes you kill yourself. 
That's a freaking great idea for a horror movie. Well, for the first crime that it does is it is exposit about is exposit about the gas, and then later on try and act, try and act like the whole try and act like the whole thing was some sort of spiritual experience after the fact, or try, or yeah. try and act like there was some kind of mystery about what happened. Yeah. No, they shouldn't that... have exp- if they wanted to leave there to be mystery, they shouldn't have exposited the gas. Mm-hmm. No, they that that's the kind of thing you don't explain. That in in a horror in a good horror you movie, show. that's the kind of thing you don't explain. You just show it and you just make up your own conclusion about it. Yep. Show and them that, tell. That's what makes you know all the suicide that it causes all the more dreadful and bleak to watch. Yeah. Um there is of course the there is of course the elephant in the room with that when it comes to um when it comes to Wahlberg and now Wahlberg when he was asked about the film he just said uh fuck it at least I, at least I wasn't playing at least I wasn't playing a cop again or a crook so <laughs> fuck it got him out of his uh got him out right. of his typecasting typecasting yeah poor Matt Damon mm-hmm. Um, well, this is Mark Wahlberg we're talking about, though. Uh, excuse, excuse me, poor, poor Mark Wahlberg. I mean, I mean, Matt Damon's pretty typecast these two these days I mean, too, but it's not really relevant to the happening. Yeah. No, no, but but Mark Wahlberg, yeah, at least he got to play in Ted. That that must have been such a respite for respite for him. I I gotta believe that was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but when it when it came to when it came to the when it came to the film, I get the sense. That the film was that the big theme of the film was supposed to be the exploration of rampant paranoia. Yeah, that that would have made for a really good psychological thriller. Because because there because there's all there's always this talk about this about some about some sort of some sort of threat that pe- that people can't see and it's making people um, antsy to the point where to the point where the, you would be. Unironically trying to th- trying to talk to a plant you think is going to try and kill you, or, or um, or the whole. I think the best the best part of that whole thing was the running away from the wind. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> where the where you have uh... the wind circling them, even though that's not how wind works. <laughs> <laughs> and and. And the wind's the, dragon, maybe, but the, but no. And the and you have it circling it, circling the whole the whole thing with the uh, with cl- with closing with closing all of the vents in the in the car and trying to cl- roll up all the windows as if that's going to as if that's going to stop the wind from getting them <laughs> when they're in a moving vehicle. That's go- as if that's going to stop the intake of a gas when you know the ability to get fresh air into the cabin is built into a car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cars are not air tight. People remember this; otherwise, it would be required to have oxygen tanks in your car. <laughs> <laughs> well, climate change might change might change things. So, no, you know. I, I'd, I um I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if in a if in a few weeks I end up seeing um the le- the le- the um di- the diehard the diehard maskers um have oxygen tanks in their ca- in their vehicles. Yeah. You can take away my fresh air. I'm like, yeah, but if you breathe that, you're gonna kill yourself. Oxygen toxicity is a thing. Dude, at, at the dude at the uh, at the Del Mar at the excuse me the San Diego County Fair, they actually have oxygen bars. If you can believe that. Oh, I believe it. I've seen I've seen those I've seen those in bars in Minneapolis. That's so stupid. It really, really fucking is. And yet, is. that mean, reminds me of so many cyberpunk dystopias. Oh, abs- oh, absolutely. Let me let uh, me go up, it, JT. Let me go up. Let me go out on a limb here. The were the were the oxygen bars serving different flavors? They were. Of <laughs> oxygen. It's true. <laughs> what? It's future. It's fucking Futurama, baby. <laughs> I am, I, um... I mean, it's a really cheap and really safe way to get high, but whatever. <laughs> it's not a safe way to get high. Oxygen it... toxicity is still a thing. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention there are people who try to breathe ozone, and to them I tell them I hope, I hope uh, the brain damage doesn't kill you too quickly. 
Okay, so uh, we're getting off topic. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> continue. Rails. Um, Rails. But the, I'd say, I'd say one of the, I'd say, um, when it comes, when it comes to, when it comes to some of the, when it comes to some of the, um, some of the, pro some of the ideas that he's had for, a f for a full on film, the big, pro the big problem with the ones that we've, that, w that we've mentioned up to this point is ultimately a film is, I think is not the proper, um, format. Like, do you, Ponder, ponder this. I'll use the happening for an, as an example for this kind of thing. Do you think that film would have been better served as instead of being a film, being a Twilight Zone episode? The happening. So you, mm. so you think that they're they're being stretched too long? Then yes. I feel. I, can, I, I do feel that. like. I do feel like some problems, some issues with these films could be uh, could be better. Could be resolved uh, with a shorter runtime. Mm -hmm. I think. I think. I can I kind of think so. Yeah, because with with a lot of the, I bring up the happening specifically because its particular idea. You're having to stre You're having to stretch the mystery of of this unseen threat that you that you still know way too little about, for two hours. And. Yeah, two hours too long. When you when you look at <laughs> when you look at most when you look at most slasher movies, even it, even if they are even if they are do even if they are doing some some measure of um of of not see the monster, you're at least getting little tidbits of informa information by the hour by the hour first hour in, if the if that. Um. But throughout a other, little, throughout, go ahead. I was going to say otherwise, you you get the setup as part of the, that particular time period. Mm -hmm. For example, um, the old Halloween movies. Uh, Michael Myers isn't really seen until the second and third acts, but you, the first act is a setup to bring him in to to establish the idea of we know. But it's also downplayed in a way so that the horror still ramps up. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And when and um, when it beca because of that, you eventually, ha as a film is going on, you have to you have to be giving people clues. And I um I don't know about you, but when I want, but because of the fact that I was foolish enough to get dragged into seeing a theater a theatrical showing of the film when when oh, it was geez. in theaters. Um, <laughs> Which was which was more of uh, which was more of a case of we got two we there's n there's nothing go there's nothing going on around here but the theater and we got and we got time to kill and we've already s and we've all the other things in the theater are films that we've seen. Um. Which which is which isn't exactly a ring endorsement. But. But after I walked out of the thing, I felt like I ran a marathon. I felt drained, simply because of the fact that the that um that there was that we that there wasn't really a there wasn't really a destination to the journey. It just, I get the idea that th that it just that it's supposed to have just happened, but you're supposed to, but e but when you come out of it, you're supposed to take something from that. And that ties into the breadcrumbs that you were talking about, like the breadcrumb approach you were talking about earlier, where there have to be clues. Um, <clears throat> you need the clues as a sort of mini catharsis to to, to uh, loosen a little bit of the tension you're building with this mystery of whatever X thing is. And on top of that, those clues can be little dopamine hits for the audience, because they see that clue, they pick it up and they go, oh! Oh, there's that. There's that thing. That's that's a thing. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the denouement, when you get to the you know the conclusion where the, the climax, where everything is all revealed and we know what's going on, uh, they can take all those clues they've gathered along the journey, add them together, and go, "Oh, this makes so much sense now!" And it's a much bigger cathartic dopamine hit. Um, the entire reason it likely felt like a marathon is you didn't get any of that. There was no release of tension. There was no. There was no catharsis. There was no uh, dopamine. You were just expected to slog and slog and slog. It was a death march. Mm -hmm. And 
Look, we, look, we look. If I want, if I want a death, if I want a death march, I'll do. I'll, I'll just go. I'll just go outside and do that. If I want a death march, I'll go work in the Japanese game development industry. Any Japanese industry, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, no, Kiyoani treats their their uh, animators very well. Yeah, but what about the in between animators in at, in Korea? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm I'm just saying it's it's I know. Uh, it, it, things aren't that great over there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know things aren't that great over here either. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a mad mad world. <sighs> but um, I but it's time it's time for me to address the the one entry that I was dread I was dreading that I would have to I would have to dredge up this memory when I, when I pick when I picked this on the docket. Oh Lord. <sighs> We need to talk about Last Airbender. <laughs> uh, okay, Ong. Uh, um. Okay, Soka. <laughs> um. Now. Okay, the one time that I will give concessions to the people who are eternally offended because yes, turning Katara and Sokka into very pale-skinned people was not at all good. Mm-hmm. Especially oh. since those actors were bad. Um, Whoever was in, de- I swear to God, the development team for this movie, Shyamalan included, they fell down and hit their heads, and they were just in a, they were just not in a state of impaired consciousness. There's, that's the only explanation I can think of, mm-hmm. outside of outright deliberate sabotage. That a they're... fever dream. Your excuse is a fever dream. <laughs> I you know I got to do something to rationalize it. It's just so bad. I think it's just Shyamalan being way too fucking full of himself. Very. Yeah, that yeah that may be that may just be it. Mm-hmm. Oy, oy. Now, when it com- when it comes to when it when it comes to Last Airbender, um. I will no- I will note that unlike so- unlike several of the films in this not all the blame lies solely on Shyamalan because Nickelodeon is not exactly the is not exactly a brain trust. <laughs> yeah, that's why they took away the entire team of writers for for Martinez and Demar- or, uh, uh, what's his name? Brian Konietzko, Konietzko. Mm-hmm. Konietzko and Demartinez uh when they uh when they wrote uh, Cora, but we've already been over that reconstruction. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Nickelodeon kind of just gave it to Shyamalan, and then didn't do any fact checking afterwards. I swear. Oh, well, that, that's that's the strange thing because the producer that was that was saddled for this was one of, was one of those meddlesome kind of producers where they where they think that they, where they think that they're the director or they're the casting agent because the reason the reason why the, I'm not sure if this was the case for all of the actors and I know that the first run of actors they they ended up doing a recast after after um, fan complaints but the actress for Katara was in was in there because that girl was liked by the by um by the producer. That's it. That's... He's he's not the casting director, so fuck him. Oh, yeah. Huh. Now, I will I will admit that um the biggest meme that came out of the biggest meme that came out of for me was Asif Mavandi playing a vi- playing a villain after <laughs> because up until this point all I knew him from was the Daily Show. Huh. Huh. And he tried, but there's only so there's only so much you can do what you can do with shit. And... Although Mythbusters did 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 uh, prove that you could polish it to high shine. <laughs> But the bit, but the bigger the um, one of the one of the bigger one of the bigger issues is any t- is I know I know Japan has had it has had a lengthy habit of of t- of um of doing a movie version of an anime that's just a truncated version of a season. Yeah. 
but let's be. But I'll be flat out honest. Most of those movies, e even in Japan, suck, or they're or they're j or they're not or they're just um they're just not all that necessary. Like the, the one except the one exception is Old Boy, which transcends its its uh, source material. It is the it. it think we ha we will always have Old Boy. Old, b but that's that's not exactly what I'm what I'm going at with this with this uh, kind okay. of thing. I'm referring oh, okay. to, okay. I'm referring to animated films based on based on anime that's that's in the middle of or has or has already had a full season, and that movie is just a truncated version of said season. I'm thinking of yeah. things like say Razafon Pluralis Concerto, or or you're, uh, or you're talking about any of the Mobile Suit Gundam movies. Yeah, right. Right, 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 right. Um, Although I, 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 w I would argue that the Mobile Suit Gundam movies are kind of necessary for people who want to get into Gundam without having to go through all of the hell of uh, getting original Gundam. Plus, get plus getting getting episodes in the in the early days was a royal pain, so I can understand why this kind of thing was done. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, it could it could be worse? They could be watching G Savior. Oh man, if you I'll I'll talk to you about it later, Monk. <laughs> that would be rails on rails. I couldn't the, I couldn't continue that sentence, yeah, I'm sorry. The point the point is trying to trying to do a trying to do say a thirteen or twenty six episode anime in the span of a film is not gonna happen. Is ve is no. very difficult. Trying to do that with with um, trying to do Trying to do that with one that is heavily serialized, goes through multiple arcs in a si in a single season with multiple characters, and has to establish its its fantasy world, is going up shit creek without a paddle. Well, I'd say it's worse than that. I wouldn't even well, say it's, it's going it's up, worse sh than that. up shit creek without a paddle. I would say that that's a uh, that's going up shit creek without a boat or a snorkel. You just. Yeah, you're, you're just swimming in the shit at that point. Mm -hmm. You're just up upstream. Just yeah. <laughs> but one of the bigger reasons that I have a grudge is the fact that if it if it weren't for if it weren't for if it weren't for that film releasing the year that it did, we would have had a perfect sweep of every Twilight movie getting a Razzie. They certainly deserved it. <laughs> Cuz this ki this came out the same year that Eclipse did. You know, I actually had forgotten about Twilight until you mentioned it. I, I had actually deleted that from my brain. Uh, um, and looking back, I'm like, geez, man, what a what a whole lot, what a whole lot, bunch of sound and fury about nothing. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway. Hmm. Well, you you know she's you know she's trying to come back, right? Ah, uh, that's. Do you mean do you mean Stephanie Meyer? <laughs> yeah. Why? Oh my. She's got her money. Fade into obscurity, you dumb bitch. <laughs> uh. uh well, Stop I, I, writing I, your teenage wish fulfillment novels. They're all bad. You write <laughs> like you're still thirteen. Well, that's why thirteen. Well, I think that's why the only audience for that stuff was thirteen year olds. But anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, the the um, that's that's the big, re but but moreover, um, much like much like I've said, much like I've said with other works, I th I um, I feel like I feel like trying to do any any sort of any sort of animated work that has that is heavy on exaggeration and trying to bring that into live action is going to be doomed to fail. So yeah, you can't get the, the you can't get the the um, notion of squash and stretch. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good way to put it. <sighs> squash and stretch is, is a classic way of referring to exaggerated cartoonism in anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because because of that because of that, um, the only the only real way to to do it is to be ridiculously expensive. And and even that even that's going to be a stretch. Yeah, Dragon Ball Evolution proved that even with ridicu ridiculousness, expensiveness, all you could do is get James Marsden in his in a fucking Kigurumi, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was the best part of that movie. 
He <laughs> fucking killed it. That ham was needed. Unfortunately, everyone else was spoiled. Yeah. And with of now grant now granted this did break a bit of a trend. This was the fir this was the first film that didn't have a twist. Um but it but the big reason why I can't I can't completely delete Last Airbender from my mind is Shyamalan wrote the foreword to the Avatar art book that I own. He what? What? They let him near that? I get the feeling that it, that 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 book was pub that that book was published before the before the film before the that film that book was being written before the film actually came out. Um, in fact, let me gr let me grab the thing. Let's see. Let me see if I can find a let me see if I can find a year. Give just give me a just give me a second. On the plus side, it's it, it was published by first edition June two thousand ten. So, I'd so I'd imagine I'd imagine it was a case of coming out right around the same time. Uh, at the very at the very least, I get the feeling they just to they just told him here write here write some stuff about a write some stuff about Avatar, because um, the art book was published by Dark Horse. Who doesn't mm -hmm. fuck up? And putting aside that forward, it is a fantastic art book. Because again, it's Dark Horse. They don't fuck around. I bet it was Nickelodeon who told Dark Horse they had to include it. Probably. That does sound like a Nickelodeon kind of thing to do. This forward from M Night Shyamalan must be must be included to help promote our shitty movie. Funny thing. Um. Funny thing is the <sighs> funny thing is the um. He doesn't even mention the movie in the for in that forward. Yeah, but just the fact that his name's in there is enough for promotion. Yeah. Um, but you would th you would think that you would think okay, now that now that we've hit rock now that I've hit rock bottom, it's th it's time to it's time to actually tr to try and actually try to try to do something. Nope, Shyamalan's twist is he likes to dig for China. Um, three years later, we get After Earth. And let me just <laughs> let me just get this front and center first. This was nothing but a nothing but a Smith family vanity project for starters. Second off, you have Will Smith playing a character named Cipher Rage. <laughs> what is this? The comics in the nineties? <laughs> no, this is worse than that. This sounds like a a fan fiction. Oh yeah, that yeah. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. It's it's it was it. This was the, this was around that time when the when 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 the Smiths were trying really really hard to tur to turn their kids into child stars. Because yeah, that that didn't blow up in their fucking faces at all. Because yeah. not at all. In the same it... span of years, we had that re we had that um, remake of the Karate Kid. Even though it was being set in China, eh. And our Mr. Miyagi, while it's fantastic that Jackie Chan was the Mr. Miyagi of that movie, um, Jackie Chan knows kung fu. Kung fu. Mm. So it's the yeah. Well, we've all we've all heard the joke. We've all heard it before. It's the it should be the kung fu kid. And but... it is in other countries. Correct. Pro probably, be probably because the pe the people marketing it aren't stupid. Well, I mean, I I can't. So here's the thing about that: that movie is actually good. No, it, which, it, it, it it's it's a good movie. It's solid. Which, mm -hmm. which is, which is proof that Shyamalan was not involved with it, mm -hmm. <laughs> but. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Hmm. But I still the the desire of the studio to bake bank on name recognition and and nostalgia was stupid. Mm -hmm. I would much rather they had named it something new, like not even like the Kung Fu Kid, not even trying to 
to appeal to something old with a name that is similar. Like, what, what, you, uh, you, there, there are so many other things you could name it. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as a, uh, as a, um, as a nod to one of the many translations for the words Kung Fu, uh, you could, you could call it, uh, hard work. Mm-hmm. Mm. But um when it comes to when it comes to something like After Earth, the whole the whole idea of the, of um of the of a, of aliens aliens that are attra that are attracted to emo that are attracted to emotion and trying to do a father son ki uh. kind of story. Um uh. once, ag once again this is so, this is something that would work very well as a, as like a Twilight Zone or Night Gallery kind kind of episode, or even out, even even Outer Limits for that for that matter. But I think we would have gotten more emotion if it had been uh, Smith opposite a dog again, yeah, like an yeah. I Am Legend. Yeah, because uh, Jaden did not do well in After Earth. No, no, no. In fact, in fact, Jaden's like a total edge lord now, actually. <laughs> And he's part of the eternally offended crowd, but we won't get into that. Uh, we won't get into that. Mm -hmm. But when it came to when it came, now, um, I will I will note that the visit and split, um, I never I never saw. Simp even though um, even though with both with um the visit, um, although for whatever for whatever reason, <laughs> in the in the hi in the highlight when I when I look it up it try it tries to redirect me to the village. Hey. It wants you to forget about the internet wants you to forget about that movie. <laughs> oh. Also, by mentioning split, you're kind of uh Isn't isn't Split the second in that trilogy? No, I thought Glass was the second in that trilogy. Glass it Glass is. I did I Glass. did but. I did see Glass, um, or rather, okay, Split. Split is meant to be a is meant to be the. I I take it back. Glass is the third part. Split was the second. That's um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sp Glass is the newest one. Although, yeah. it doesn't. Although it doesn't really feel like a trilogy. It feels like a. It feels like a. It feels like a trilogy post hoc. If you follow me. Yeah. No, I, I get what you're saying, because Unbreakable with both Willis and Jackson as their respective characters opposite each other uh, felt completely distinct from uh, McAvoy as the split Persona character. Mm -hmm. And then the third movie, Glass, puts them all in the same place. Yeah. The and two universes felt, felt distinct. Um, Indeed. Glass is, Glass is a case of not of not seeing through your implications because the idea the idea of of keep of keeping the cost low by set by setting it in in a in a very confined area, I'm okay with that. If when you when you know when you know what you're doing, but the but the problem is once again lack of commitment. And more, and moreover, having a, having a story that se that seems to demand it. Just because you just because you want to set it in a confined area doesn't mean that the story is going is that every that you can do any story in that confined area. Some stories are going to need larger spaces, and this was clearly one of them. Mm -hmm. um, what I find what I find very amusing is when the film came when Glass came out. There were a f there were a fair few people t talking about how it seemed like Shyamalan was trying to set up his own superhero universe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know, I know that, I know that the idea of trying to set up a cinematic universe is a ca is a case of it was the style at the time. But I d but I don't think I don't think that would I don't think that would really apply and given how, and given how um glass was not well received I don't think that's going to be revisited unless he unless he's su unless he's um suitably snorting a few lines after the fact you never uh, you help, never know help me out here do we like split or not split was 
better, but I can't. But I can't. I can't say whether or not it was genuinely good, or whether or whether or not the badness had been grandfathered in. I mean, um, I would it, say that Split is, and this is actually not pun intended, but it is Split between both. Uh, well, you, well, you got this amazing bit of character acting by uh, McAvoy. Did a fantastic fucking job, I and mean, this is. This... Bre- breath breathtaking absolutely yes, yes. and that that elevates that movie his his acting alone elevates that movie this is this is hailing back to lady in the water uh this is uh essentially if paul giamatti had been allowed to do his type of acting this is the type of elevation you could have seen in the movie yes yes now the premise <sighs> there was there was no real twist to split if i remember correctly we knew that the beast was just another thing inside of him. Mm. Like it was, he was talking about it openly as parts of the movie. Um. So really, this is this rather than being a hidden monster type of horror, this is a hunt type of horror, mm. where you know who the slasher is, you see them all the time. The suspense is more in: Will these people get away? How they hide? How they're discovered? How they're taken out? Whether it's brutal. I uh, I honestly feel that if he had gone more B uh, B roll horror movie slasher, more a little a little more slasher to it, it would have been great. Mm-hmm. But he didn't. Like, this this now stems to the failure to commit again. Yeah. Um. He he had the slasher elements in place, and he just didn't push them far enough. Mm-hmm. It's too it's too milk toast. And one, this this is now um, obviously we can, obviously we can't talk about old because that's not out yet. Um, I have, uh, I get, uh, but I can already tell it's one of those that would work better as a Twilight Zone episode. And speaking of that, there is one, there is um, one project that he was, he wasn't direct, he didn't direct, but he was involved in that. I would be remiss if I didn't discuss, and that is um, Devil. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That one. Devil was par- Devil was going to be the first part of an anthology project that he was that he was working on, and he didn't direct that per se, but he did, um, pr- but he did produce and oversee it. And the and um the. The whole, the whole, pre- the whole premise. You know, you've got, you got people trapped. You got people trapped in an elevator with that may, that may or may not be possessed by the devil. Um, and there was no love in that elevator. <laughs> and I don't even. I, I, I remember somebody wanted me to watch that movie, and I took a look at the synopsis, and I was like, "Nah, that seems boring." It's dumb. It's it's it it get well. It's not. It, it it by itself it's not dumb, but it gets dumb. There's a lot of dumb stuff in it. It just sounded boring. I was just like, I'm gonna be bored watching people in an elevator for an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that or that's longer. The, that's the sin it commits is boredom, and which is probably the worst sin you could commit in a movie. Look, I love me a good chamber play. I I do. Yeah, if if, if it were done well. But this is meant to be like a suspense horror, and suspense mm-hmm. horror has to have movement if you want it to have uh, staying power. There, even the smallest amount of movement. You know, the, the suspense horror in if somebody trapped in someone's house. There's still the game of cat and mouse as you move from room to room, find little shortcuts between rooms, things like that. It's a, it's it's not exactly a chamber play, but it is still a small con- smaller confined area. Fuck it, we're doing a bottle episode. Um, here, <laughs> although here's here's the here's the there's a bit there's a bit of a problem though. This the whole the whole trapped on an elevator horror horror kind of setup. Um, it's been it's been do, it's been done before. It was done in 1996. As a and surprise surprise, it was as a short film. Yeah, called Elevated by Vincenzo Natali, the guy who would later on do the cult classic Cube. Mm. Yes, and 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 like I said, it, he he had to keep it short because without the ability to move, to have some sort of 
element of motion within the suspense, you, 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 your staying power dies. Mm -hmm. You don't you have to find a good conclusion with the amount of staying power you have at that point. You're limited. Um, which is actually why the movie Phone Booth yeah, I movie. remember that one. That was that was technically movie. a chamber play, and, and that it was, was it was good mm -hmm. because the only person trapped was one person. Everybody else that was an actor outside of the chamber, and they were technically audience to the person in the chamber, just like we were audience to them. It was it was a a chamber play within a wider stage. And that worked to help mm -hmm. overcome the limitations there. Yeah, underrated movie, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. Most We're... people didn't like it because it was a guy in a phone booth for an hour and a half. Uh, uh, but it was still good. I liked mm -hmm. it. Uh, and and th to compare that again to Devil, um, yeah. if there had been that secondary audience effect, something to give us a sense of momentum, a sense of, of some sort of continuous action, um, rather than the vaguer the, the the vagaries that we got, uh, it probably could have been better. Mm -hmm. Who knows? And when it and um, I think that's I think that's all of them. I think there there's there's some small works here and there, but I think I think that I think that covers the bulk. The bulk of the filmography, and there there were a couple of ones before Sixth Sense that he that he did, but um, those aren't those aren't important. But one thing one thing that I do want to address is that with the majority of the ones we've talked about, there was there was some kind of twist, and then he and then he tr and then he tried to not do twists in in the work when that be when that became a when that uh, made him into a running joke. Um. Like we like we said at the beginning of the episode, the twist. twist. Even robot, even robot chicken, had his yeah. number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when robot I'm, chicken has your number, you know you've made it. <laughs> I'm I'm cur I'm curious I'm curious about this. I have I've been of the opinion that him ha him having a great deal of success with a film with a twist ending was the worst thing that could happen to him. Pigeonhole him. Yeah, because because I get the feeling a lot of people saw, a lot of people saw that and either either he encouraged it or or um studio he or studio heads encur encouraged it because whenever whenever something's a success they want to see they want to see it repeated. I think he got delusional on his own, on on his own hype. I think. Yeah. On the hype on the hype around him. He, he he did he did start buying into his own hype as you could see from his increased involvement in his movies. Mm -hmm. Indeed, as as a character within them, I should say. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I'm fine with doing the Hitchcock, you know, walk on, you know, walk on set character, but I I don't know. If or or if he had done or, what what Tarantino does and or, played yeah, to his strengths. Yeah. I, I was just about to say that even Taran yeah, or even Tarantino, but Tarantino was actually acting. You know what I'm saying? Oh, well, tempting to. He just plays to well, his strengths to make sure that his weaknesses well, yeah, yeah. in acting aren't as exposed. Well, that's that, that is true. That is true. Which is still good directing, knowing that you're weak in a certain area and that you need to put yourself in an area where those weaknesses are not showing. That's hi. still good directing. Mm hi -hmm. hi. So I uh, honestly, he, he bought into his own hype, which caused himself to pigeonhole. And then when he realized that pigeonholing wasn't helping him and that his own hype was probably uh, needed a, a shift and a change, he tried to do something different but never committed. Mm -hmm. and the, the, the lack of twists, if he had committed to some really solid storytelling in the, in the, in the stuff with his uh, lack of twists and just gone balls to the wall with some of the things. Again, Split comes to mind. If he had gone full slasher with some of those scenes... That would have been such a fucking good movie. I I agree, man. That that could have been something. I think I think one thing that really that really screwed him over and really screwed really screws a lot of directors o directors over, and not just and other creatives as well, is when is when they get in their head that they are that they are some sort of artiste. Like you, you look at you look at a lot of the people who have created cl who have created classic art. 
th throughout hit throughout history, and a lot of a lot of them will let will likely will likely think think of themselves as nobody special, just some just some guy who does things. If you want a modern example, look no further than Yoko Taro. The man, mm -hmm. the man says that he's nothing special. All he has is is something he wants to convey to the player, and that's just what he does. Yeah. Whereas, whereas, if if you want to if you want to see the opposite of Yoko Taro, since we're going down that route, consider consider the guy who created um, Yik. Who went on? Who went on the Dick Show afterwards and and compl and complained that no that that um vi that because of the fact that people didn't respond to his up t approach, that video games can't be art; they're just toys. That video game is terrible, and I'm glad I never played it. <laughs> I, this, you would think that you would think that I would have. I no. didn't. I know that you wouldn't play something that uh, features what is essentially neo postmodernism as as its entire fucking theme. Well, then then I saw then I started to see articles where there where there were certain lines of dialogue that were straight up plagiarized. Well, there's that too, and then of course there's the fact, oh, like. There's integrating a integrating a integrating a, a a actual murder case into into your story is not a, is um not in the best taste. Uh, oh yes, the the tragic death of a of a of a lady was great inspiration for his game. Mhm. Mm and uh, the infamous elevator death if yeah. you're familiar there, uh, JT. Uh no, but you don't have to go into it. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a pretty infamous case. If you look up uh, ele Japanese lady elevator murder, you should be able to find it pretty mm -hmm. easy. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, yeah. abduction because she cut she disappears, but it's assumed she's dead. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, okay. But what? But um, because of, but because of because of the fact that with with a lot of those early film with a lot of those early films, you ha you um. You have that. You have this. He let. He would like to. He would like to put in these out. El these elemental. These elements of, thing of things like de of things like destiny of thi of things like predetermination, um, thing, things like things like um, thing things like a ch a almost an almost fairy tale one an almost fairy tale wonder, in in the mo in the modern. Um, mm -hmm. That's the kind. That's the kind of thing that gets that gets in your head because I've, I've made this clear, and Critical Drinker has also talked about this quite a bit. Um, themes drinker. do not make a story. No, no, they do not. And trying to even, even Undertale, which is chock full of memes, does not rely on those memes to be story like. I didn't say I memes. Said, I said themes. He, he, yeah, he said oh, themes. I misheard uh, you entirely. The Eames. Yes. Yes, I misheard you entirely. Those are my ears. Sorry. Um, Whoops. If you want, brain is brain is not braining. <laughs> if you if you want if you want an if you want an example of of this kind of overemphasizing on themes, this is the reason why I absolutely despised both Midsummer and um, well, pretty pretty much everything that Jordan Peele has done. Hmm. I um, did. I've seen Midsummer and. Nah, nah. Well, it's, Midsummer was nah. meh. Um, get eh. Get Out was oh, Get Out was half okay. Um, us, I despised. Do you, Do you know the the thing I enjoyed about us? Hmm. Because I was I was actually dragged to a theater to watch this, and the person watching with me actually liked it. The thing I liked about us was the brutality of the kills no matter who was making them i'm okay. sorry that was that was really that was really it that's kind of damning <laughs> that's kind of damning with faint praise i'd say it it, mm. it it is um and then of course jordan peele pulled a pulled a Shyamalan at the end of us and I really, I really think we should. I really think we should get to. We should get to brass tacks about 
what makes a good what makes a good twist? What makes a bad twist? Um, for the for that one th now I have my own first experiences with the idea of a twist ending in film, but I'd be curious as to what as to what um as to what your guys is first record first recorded instance that you can remember of a twist ending in a um film. Well, well hold on. You mean like personal experience or yes. like in? Oh, okay. Well, I uh, I think before we get into our own personal first experiences, we should set a baseline. Yeah. Now, is is the ending of The Sixth Sense a good twist, yes or no? Yes. Okay. I would say so. Okay. And what elements about The Sixth Sense make the twist good? Because... It, it because it was right in front of you the whole time. Everything was in front of you the whole time. You just you just weren't see, you just weren't seeing it from the from the prop from a certain angle, from the proper perspective. Mm -hmm. Correct. So what establishes a good twist is how well perspective is manipulated, and how foreshadowed it is, even with perspective being manipulated. Would you would you agree that those are two elements? That's a yeah. very good definition. Yeah. So a good twist ending is one that has set the breadcrumbs, and for those more astute within the audience, they may have some understanding. But even then, the twist still surprises them too. To, for a twist ending to be good, it has to surprise everyone but the most hyper vigilant uh, and hyper obsessive. Mm-hmm. Because the hyper vigilant and the hyper obsessive will always find it, or um, my or my mom, she just finds it without even trying. <laughs> that's what we call hyper intuitive. Um, <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> so, in, in that respect, um, maybe our, our first experiences with twist endings in our lives may not even be good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, w w with that baseline uh, established, uh, JT, go ahead. Oh gee, uh, you know, the first time a twist really hit me. Look, trying to, I am quickly fast forwarding through my entire uh, film exposure. Uh, you know, honestly, I would say honestly. I, you know what? I I really lo I'm loath to say this, but the first time a twist really hit me was the Sixth Sense. Uh, yeah, that was the first time I actually was legitimately blown away by you know because it was so it was right in front of you the whole damn time because it was so such a because it was so damn well well written. I mean, that was the first time that that's the first time that really resonated and stuck in my memory as. At the time, a movie actually shocked me, and just completely, you know, you know, gobsmacked me. That's a good. That's a very good way to put it. So I would say that's my earliest. Um, that would be my earliest exposure. I'd say. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's pretty lame, but uh, pr pretty lame as far as examples go. But it, it's fine. Mm. Now. When it uh, no, I will, I will say this: um, mm -hmm. a, a, a twist that is that wasn't right in front of you the whole time that I really liked um, at the very end is uh, the game starring Michael Douglas, uh, directed by David Fincher. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't. It, that's not a case of a, a twist that's in front of you the whole time, but the ending is very shocking, and you know you you're like, what? Whoa! And yeah, you know, I don't know. That that was that was a fun. Uh, twist or reveal for me for me that i'd say that was like number the second one uh that which is more interesting than the sixth sense so okay i'll uh so yeah the game with michael douglas mm -hmm. um zan so i'm having trouble dragging that through my brain um Yeah. 
Yeah, if it, yeah. Sometimes we end up asking the hard hitting questions. <laughs> I think it. I think it might have to be, probably also because I was so young when I first saw this movie. Um, Dead Again, starring Kenneth Branagh and, and Emma Thompson. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like you, you get the, you get the idea early on that they're supposed to be reincarnations of this murder case, but. Uh, and then you you start hearing few things here and there, and uh, and then there's the the twists about who's actually whom in the end and what happened to whom. It 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 it, it probably wasn't as abrupt a twist as something like The Sixth Sense, but I know it really stuck with me. Mm-hmm. It's hard to hard to define. I got I got I got gotcha. you. Um, for me, the for me, um, it come it it came. I will I will note that I ended up seeing stuff stuff like the Sixth Sense um, late. Um, one of the big one of the big ones for for me gr- for me growing up was. Um, Fight Club. Mm. Club I saw after the Sixth Sense. How could I forget Fight Club? Oh my gosh! Mm. And and I was actually spoiled to that twist. Oh bummer! Because I had read the actual uh, Chuck novel beforehand. But, Chuck Palahniuk. Mm-hmm. Which is which? I guess you could say is a different twist then, because the ending of the movie is fucking miles different from the ending of the book miles different yeah and um that that bring that brings that brings in the debate the debate about how how accurate an adaptation has to be but that is it didn't... that's a story for another night yeah fight club damn it how could i okay i'm changing mind to fight club that was... <laughs> i mean fight club but... came out after the Sixth Sense, didn't it? Yeah, but I didn't see the Sixth Sense until after Fight Club, so you know. Ah, true. I, I go- saw I saw them basically in order. No, we're, no, we're going by my chronology here. That my works. Personal chronology, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I stepped out for a second. What was yours, Zan? Did you decide on one? Dead Again, um, an old thriller movie uh, directed by Kenneth Branagh, starring Kenneth Branagh and Emma Thompson as. People who were in love with each other that had reincarnated into new people who were in love with each other in different bodies, sort mm. of, kind of. There was there was this there were a lot of big like smaller twists within it, and the the final twists of who's who um, really hit me hard. But I was also a really young kid, so yeah, easily we, easily impressed. So. Yeah, still I would, counts. I would, I would say the some of the best twists and the the majority of twists I've experienced would probably be from anime, actually. Uh, <laughs> anime and manga. Uh, they, uh, I've, you know, there's some pretty, yeah, there's some that's pretty good, you know, uh, when, it, when uh, specifically like a cerebral series that deal with a lot of, you know, uh, more strategy and uh, you know mentalism and uh, is that a word? Uh, mentalism, yes. Yeah, and more uh, mentalism and and uh, intellectually based um, competition or in uh, or confrontations or whatever like that. I, I've always enjoyed the twist of you know putting plans into motion and uh, you know uh, you know how uh, you know being you know revealed how it you know was all you know uh, mani- manipulated and conjured uh, in it. So. You know, anime has been a source of that, just for my personal experience. And Ke- Keikaku Dori, anyone? Keikaku Dori. I was about to say just as Keikaku. Um, exactly. But if if we're gonna go that far, we need to we need to go back to my favorite Ellen series and uh, and anime series of the Tony Tens, uh, No Game No Life. 
Um, <laughs> let's 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 not just go with the fact that they that they outsmart a being that has been around for oh, thousands of years and plays a game where it's word chain that materializes the things you say and dematerializes the things that are already there. Um, let, let's let's ignore that fact because that one's pretty word, impressive. Word like, chain? You mean Shiratori? Huh? Yes, Shiratori. I know, Shiritori. but. Uh, Hi, hi. <laughs> but uh, let's let, let's let's just ignore that materialization word chain was fucking insane by itself, and the fact that they somehow uh, um, baited Jibril into using Anjakunobubun, which is of course the words for empty-headed academic, or at least in one translation. Mm -hmm. um, and in the anime, she says there's there was no guarantee I would use this word. Um, you're crazy, you know, and their response is, well, you have to be insane to, to face God. No, let's, <laughs> let's go to the light novel where they say, oh, well, we had about 20 other words in mind in case, in case you didn't say that one. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's go to the fact that in the Ellen, they are stronger than they, what are they are shown in the anime. One of the few, one of the few times that happens in an anime adaptation, yeah. but let's, let's skip all of that to the face down with, er, with, uh, the showdown with uh with the Eastern uh Federation with 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 the the war beasts the the were beasts depending on your translation and the virtual reality um gal gun it's it's outright gal gun um <clears throat> but you're just shooting them with your marrow marrow gun your your love love gun uh. <laughs> Let's let's go down to the fact that they the the entire time you're watching these two episodes and reading the light novel that that covers this entire confrontation, uh, you, you everything seems to be that the good guys are losing. They're about to lose. They're going to lose this game, and then they both get shot, and you're like, oh well, that's it. And then the one challenger, because it's four on one, uh gets shot in the back of the head by a character everybody forgot about because she's been pretty foolish the entire time and because what happened was one of the two main characters the younger sister calculated every fucking npc routine route in the game loaded a character on an npc and used the magic of the world they're in to establish that she is to remain asleep until the NPC reaches a point where she's almost out of the power that she has to shoot because NPCs slowly drain that, and then shoot straight in front of her with her eyes closed. And they did it this way because they noticed the NPCs make no sound. Mm -hmm. And so long as you aren't intending to shoot somebody, the war beasts can't really sense your your apprehension and your and your attention. That right there, and this is only season one and only the first three novels, mm. that right there was a twist I haven't even seen it coming. I, I was like, how are they going to get out of this? They're both headshots. Who's left? Jabril? Maybe Jabril comes in from above? And then she gets shot in the back of the head. I'm like, oh, Jabril came and saved the day after all. And it's fucking Stephanie Dola riding piggyback on an NPC. I'm like, <laughs> no. What? No. What? <laughs> it was that moment where you just you're like huh <laughs> you, you want that sort of twist yes anime actually does it pretty fucking well yeah and and, and more and more often and more consistently than uh than well uh, than other than other mediums uh I, I don't know it just it just has a knack for it there but, is uh, one yeah. there is one thing you guys are you guys have kind of glossed over that I feel that I feel it, that I feel is worth noting when you're making this kind of comparison about about doing twists at the very at the very minimum a anime is getting an anime is pro is probably going to have like three is going to have um 12 episodes if we're dealing with OVA we're going to have OVAs we're going to have a whole lot less um but we're but we're going to have we're going to have multiple episodes regardless. With a manga, yeah. you have multiple chapters, multiple vol sometimes multiple volumes, regardless. That means that you have time to set to set up, set to set up status quo so you so you can flip the table. 
Definitely. With uh, and a film, you are you have much less in the way of t- in the way of time. Even, yeah. Even though you still have to you still have to set up where where the story is taking place, who are the major players, and how the story is going to be using all of them. Yes. And what I the reason why the reason why I wanted to go into this whole to this whole thing with um, twists is is the fact that I th- is the fact that to me a good tw- a good twist is w- is one where all again where all the pieces fall into place and it was right in front of you the whole time you just weren't seeing it um right. and when it comes and, and and if you can if you go and you, it makes you go back and rewatch it a second time and then you see and then so many things come to the foreground that you didn't notice it before mm mm-hmm. mhm and when it comes to uh, when it comes, but the, but there's two there's two things to um to keep to keep in mind. First off, a twist is a very high stakes gamble. Yes. It ha- it ha- it is an, it is it is an it is a all it is an all in scenario on, in poker, and if you and um if that twist does not work, no matter how good the film is up until the twist is revealed. The whole film goes down with it. Yep, hi, I'd say hi. I'd say a picture perfect example of this kind of thing is um, the Usual Suspects, which is my which has been my poster child for years. Kaiser Soze. To, yeah, Kaiser Kaiser Soze. What not to do when doing a twist? Because first off, if you're doing a Who Done It. And you and you, and I'm supposed to act surprised that the that the big suspect is the timid one. Um, you haven't you haven't been doing this for very long, to the point where I may as well use the first time meme. Sec- <laughs> first time. <laughs> Second is the is the fact that it's is that it's ver- it's very hard to it's very hard to go to go that to go that and I've talked about this in the past. Um, if the story is coming, if if you're going to have it that the, that that person is supposed to be the is supposed to be the culprit, don't have them be the narrator for the whole time because, for all for all you know, you may have just been fed a lie for two hours by that point. Yeah, because uh, if he's the narrator the entire time, it kind of becomes obvious. Mm-hmm. Um. The, if you if you want a good twist in a Who Done It, you need an unreliable narrator or a series of unreliable narrators. Yeah, this is the this is the. It's kind of it's kind of funny that the that um that singer said that he, that the that um the big inspiration f- the two big inspirations for um the Usual Suspects were Rashomon and Citizen Kane. Except doesn't exactly work because Rashomon had multiple perspectives, and so did Citizen Kane for all for that matter. Whereas with with the usual suspects, it's all verbal. Um, yep. Now the reason I the reason I bring this up in relation to in, in relation to Shyamalan is when it comes to when it comes to his twists. Um, when you stop and think about it structurally, he was doing the same twist for four movies straight. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of of some sort of some sort of uh, some sort of unseen unknow- unknowable threat. That it that is that is talked about but rarely seen in the in the in the sense of the monster under the bed, but it, but that but that particular part is stretched so long that by the t- by the time the rubber band snaps, you're not able to your the rubber band has snapped completely in two and you're not able to restretch the thing. Mm-hmm. Um. And when it and because and um this is also the reason why I've. I've said many times, anybody who does that line about how the, it's not about the destination, it's the journey, is full of shit. It's both. It's always both. It is It is always both, and a bad destination can invalidate a journey. Yep. Now, um, I, I know that we're, we're talking specifically twists in mm-hmm. relation to film because it, it takes a little more finesse in those cases because you have only that short window of time mm-hmm. um which is why maybe we do get more consistency in anime and video games 
because it has they have it it's a uh, lot more time to more, to establish to establish and, set up and build and yeah and drop the and drop the breadcrumbs um and, and to, even to mislead even then, to to mislead the the audience you know yeah, to, on, to on the way red herrings and false and false uh paths yeah correct um i mean the, the revelation that ovon was triage in dot hack gu was actually pretty strong if you weren't keeping up mm -hmm. on the japanese while waiting for the english drop of the game but that's different okay okay <laughs> um even 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 if you were even if you were uh, missing uh, missing a lot of the hints that were go that were going on when it came to um gu in that in that regard um the 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 purpose of that kind of twist is uh, is also to recontextualize um relationships yep recontextualize the relationships and to raise the stakes mm -hmm. because the story was not finished at that point no. um but it, when it comes to especially a medium like video games because of the interactive nature immersion is more likely mm -hmm. and because immersion is more likely twists can hit even harder which means your twists actually need to be better uh, like, the world the world ends with you uh god that you, twist it, early on too oh yeah exactly yeah just wow well and, and, i i'm not gonna i'm not gonna mention it because i will never spoil that game for anybody yeah uh, but uh um, it's, no, it's on nintendo I, switch they they did re-release it go go buy it it's a game worth buying uh, get the DS version if you can. It's the definitive version. The gameplay and the uh, and the uh, thematic storytelling is better interwo better interwoven and represented uh, and paralleled. Um, and, and they're coming out with a sequel, Neo Twewe, on July twenty seventh. So get on that shit. Okay, yeah. plug over. <laughs> yeah, but the the a good twist. But, yeah, yeah. The the twists in in video games because of the immersion aspect have to actually be stronger mm -hmm. which means that the setup also has to be tighter they still have more time to work in that's always a plus that more time to work in means you can weave a tighter trap as it were um but i have gotten tons of t <sighs> when was the last time it happened to me what game was it? A game that it actually sort of ruined the game for me. I know that there's times like that where you get you get the you get the breadcrumb, you get the trail. Things are building up. You've got the foreshadowing. It's always been in front of you. But what was in front of you was kind of just, eh, eh yeah. And it's not even like if if it were a twist that had been compressed into an anime format or into a film format, you probably would have been pretty excited. But because of the immersion aspect, because you are more involved, because it is an interactive medium, mm -hmm. you, you 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 hit it, and it's like it's just not there. The the same level of of yeah, that twist is cool. You get to the twist, and like there's there's not more to it. That's all. I mean, it's nice, but it, it uh, eh. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, um, since we since we mentioned long term, mentioned long term stories that tr that tried to do it, that tried that did a twist well. I want to mention a long term story that did that didn't, and that is Children of, and that is um Miracle Day. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Or the tw the twist was there was no twist. We still don't know what exactly caused the whole thing to go down. Hmm. Yeah. It, it it. That's kind of the that's kind of the opposite of Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei, where there's a twist, where there's a plot twist at the end in a series that up to that point had no plot. Yeah. It was yeah. it was just a it was just a it was just a comedy series, a ridiculously no, no, crack no. a ridiculously cracktastic one. <laughs> that has given me that has given me several memes over the years, but still. And yeah. one of the finest examples of Japanese wordplay ever. 
Uh, outside of Nisi, uh, outside of Nisio Oisin, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> now, with now, within the within the within that um, t I'd say I'd say I'd say one of the other issues with the kind of twists that Shyamalan was trying to do is it, and some some of this some of this may be his fault and some of this may not be. But I remember how a lot of his films were marketed, and they were marketed as either thrillers or horror stories. Yep. Most mm -hmm. of them are, 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 are marketed as thrillers. And when you actually sit when you actually sit down and look at the and look at the proper thing, it's not really that. I mean you I... you definitely have you definitely have aspects of that, but you have a you have a whole lot of you have a whole lot of quiet, subdued, um, not non-scored moments, and a actually, I th actually I think um, I think that's I think scoring scoring less moments in storytelling is something that certain producers need to t need to take note of. I think, I think, um, I think you could you could say that the Sixth Sense is most definitely a dramatic thriller. Um, you've got some pretty big, scary moments for some people, like the burnt woman and the puking girl and all that fun stuff. Because mm -hmm. those those genuinely scared the pants off of a lot of people, including my little sister. Um, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, she she got scared at a few of the rather good makeup, uh, you know, especially the burned act, the the burned, uh, um backstage assistant during the the school play and all that oh, yeah. um but the the whole thing is that not all of his stories could be that same way mm -hmm. signs wasn't really a thriller it was more an action drama that was, was that was trying to that was trying it was still trying to be a mystery story. Yep. Almost I'd say I'd say it was trying to lean on the idea of being a who done it story, honestly. Just pl just play just playing on the whole um on the whole crop on the whole crop circle phenomenon. And we've proven that people can create crop circles in like 3 hours in the middle of the night. It's no, it's no mystery. It's no, it's not, it's not aliens. It's just people who really know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah, Alamouse, yeah. Alamouse don't care. Yeah. Um. And the. And to and to be fit to be fair, the idea the idea of the idea of building on, on that kind of thing, isn't a, isn't a terrible one. But the the once again you once again you have the problem of. I'd actually in fact I just realized something. I just had a I just had a bit of a light bulb moment. Ding. When, when I when I really start to think about it. Shyamalan had the exact same fixation on a mystery box, that Abrams does. Hmm. You look at hit. You look at how he does his monsters, and it very much is a. It very much is a mist. It very much is a mist. It very much is a kid imagining what's in a box. Much in the same way that Abrams talked about in that in that in that um, TED talk he did years and years ago. Oh, so it's a fixation on trying to grasp the fear of the unknown. The... And, mm -hmm. and the real problem with that is if you become expected to it, you, your unknown is now known. Yeah, that I've of, I've often said that the um, that the har the hardest one of the hardest genres to do any sort of follow up in is horror, which is wh which is why horror sequels tend to not always be good. Yeah, there are there are a few horror sequels out there that I would say are exceptions, but they approve the rule, mm -hmm. such as uh, Insidious and Insidious Two, both really good movies. I haven't seen the last one, so I don't know how that follow up works. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, I I didn't bother with Insidious. I prefer my horror with a twi with a twist of humor or camp to mm -hmm. take the edge off. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I I definitely understand that most people need that that little edge of a uh, edge to pull off the 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 they need the catharsis again. The, the whole release of tension has to be there. Um, That's why Hellsting is so good. You got all this, you know, badass, you know, blood, guts, and you know, viscera, and then you'll have a completely completely uh, irreverent, inappropriate joke just fly out of nowhere and just totally break up the break up the momentum. And it's great. Mm. Like the fact that they had to put Saris in a coffin to fly over to, to Rio. Exactly. Just something that takes you out of it for a brief moment. And you're just like, oh yeah, I'm reading a com I'm reading a comic. Yeah. <laughs> Actually what what immediately comes to mind is is the dream sequences in the manga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are good. Uh... Yeah, those are good. Oh. But one per one particular uh, one particular part of the one particular, but one particular aspect of his, of his storytelling that I haven't that I haven't touched upon is is his fi is his fixation with with pre with predestination, which he's kind which he's kind of talked about in some films and been bl and been blatant about in the case of something like Lady in the Water. Um, the big reason that the big reason that I don't talk, that I don't talk about that is because he never because even though there's once again. Themes don't do a whole don't do a whole lot, especially if you don't actually use them. Yeah, themes are a vehicle; they need to convey something. Um, now, of course, I'd be remiss if I point if I didn't point out that my be my benchmark for using predestination as as a major theme and doing something with it is X. But that but um. <laughs> <laughs> I want my ending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being being a fan being a fan of X is suffering. As as you are uh, fond of saying <laughs> say, saying, Monk, God is punishing us for our hubris, and our work is never finished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, why can't we just have an ending, Clamp? It's been long enough. There's no disasters that can make it look bad. I feel your suffering. I'm still waiting on a second season of Soccer a Clear Card. <laughs> oh well, that that's that's a guaranteed. That's one of the few times Madhouse's curse hasn't interfered in anything. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, I I I I feel your pain with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pre predestination, <sighs> predestination is a hard one to pull off in almost anything, though. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, predestination is a theme that you can use well feels to me like it works best in novels in in books because with those like even outside of graphic novels actual just full on text literature because of the fact that your mind does do filling in on so many blanks so when predestination comes into play your brain has full license to run with that hmm and so, because uh, predestination in video games almost never works. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, interactive medium, gamers like to do, like to be, like to have freedom to do things. Mm -hmm. Predestination is diametrically opposed to that. I'd say the only time it, I'd say the only time it quote unquote worked was Kingdoms of Amalur, and that's kind of cheating on my part. That is cheating on your part. Um, I would say the closest the closest uh, use of predestination effectively in video games um, I'm going to say God of War. I'm going to say God of War. Not just well, because of the in medias res beginning of the first game, but because uh, anyone familiar with Grecian Myth is going to understand exactly what happens when gods fight and how petty and, and you know well, petulant they are. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. That's just the that's just the way uh, that Greek myth and legend goes. You know, mm -hmm. and there's out. yeah, and then there's the whole predestination of you know you're the only one who can who can 
face down your own father just like he faced down his. So mm-hmm. there's there's that use of predestination. And then there's the really clever attempt to flip that on its head in in God of War 2018. Where he tries to tell his his son, no, you don't have to be like we are. The cycle ends here. He's trying to break predestination. Which, of course, Freya and the rest of, uh, of the Acer that Freya being Vanir, but and then the rest of the Acer who are still around are not going to. Uh, they're, wow. they're they're gonna they're they're not gonna allow his interference to fly, which could still end up with with well with, let's call him by his real name Loki um, <laughs> involved in the cycle of gods, but. That's that entire idea of predestination, while still allowing so much freedom to the player, was a fantastic use. Um, regardless of anyone's opinions on the gameplay or stories of God of War, maybe it's just not your type of game, maybe you just don't like that type of story, but the use of the theme of predestination was well performed in that game. Yeah. The the point The point is, is that the presence the presence of a theme of so, of something within the subtext means absolutely nothing if you don't use it then it doesn't become subtext it becomes text or at worst purple prose and i would argue that some of his attempts for, to use predestination were ham-fisted as hell mm-hmm. um going back to my favorite kicking boy the signs um the whole, oh, she's always leaving half-drunk cups of water around everywhere. It was it was like it was meant to be that way. Or, oh, uh, my wife, as she was dying, pinned to a tree by a truck, said, uh, you know, tell, tell your brother to, sw- uh, to swing hard. And, you know, the doctors explain that as, oh, she's just having a hallucination as she dies. You know. And, uh, that that sort of predestination isn't predestination. It's hell. It's not even foreshadowing. It's it's bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, what I what I do what I do find funny is that um, I came across when I was doing research for this. I came across a interview from the a interview um in Rolling Stone, where he said that his movies are spiritual and have an emotional perspective. Um, uh, lofty. Which, to me, to me, um, to me, sounds like some sounds like something that a that a self proclaimed artist would say. I would call him a pretentious dick to his face. Um. And. The and um. There is, and of course, of course, some, um, of course, in the last in the last few years, some pe- some people have tried to spin the narrative that people making fun of how hard it is to say his name is is some is some form of is some form of racism, or people picking on him because of how hard to pronounce his name is, and um, and a lot a big ch- a big chunk of it came from came from this long ass article from the British Film Institute, but fuck them, um, by the. And I can and I can say that because hey England, how does it feel? How does it feel to go to, to go to your first final in sixty years and still lose? Eh. I was dealing I was dealing with it's coming home boasts from a bunch from a bunch of people over the last few days. So, <laughs> so I get to see the narrative reinforce itself, and I couldn't be happier. Because the sports gods are cruel bastards. Yep. But. This, but the, but um, the idea that the idea that they are spiritual and have an emotional perspective, um, the big, pro- if that's, if that's really the case or really not the case, if it is, good for you, but doesn't do me any good. Sim- simply because of, simply because of the fact that you're not you're, for all intents and purposes. If you're if what you're writing it looks like a thriller, 
people are going to be treating it as a thriller. If you're writing a film that's supposed to be a, that's supposed to be a be about spir a spiritual perspective, then people will take it as such. You haven't been writing a sp a, sp a emotional spiritual kind of story. You try and you try and put it into the subtext, but the focus is never on that. Your focus has always been on some as on some sort of out some sort of outside threat in the closet. Uh -huh. mm. And if I see if I seem a bit hostile towards the, towards this whole spiritual and emotional perspective, it's because um, I don't care for purple prose. It's also a cop out. Mm -hmm. Not just an, an acknowledgement of him using superfluous language, but it's a cop out. And it's a cold day in hell, but um, but I'll I will at least get I will at least give the likes of Michael Bay this credit in the sense that when he when he sa when he says that he makes films for the a for the average moviegoer, at the I'll get as bad as Bay is, and he is very very bad. He is he has never tried to pretend that he's anything but. And I can give the devil its due, at least on that front. Mm. The problem ends up ends up revealing itself when you tr when you tr when you try and portray your when you try and portray yourself as more than what than what it is. When you when you if you end up if you end up saying it's not a film it's a statement on the human condition, no no it's not it's a fucking film. <laughs> nope nobody cares about nobody cares about your about your philosophical essay and certainly your college professor doesn't mm. that's my that's my take at least but when you when you zan when you said that that you found it to be a cop out i have my guesses as to what you mean by that but i'm curious as to your take um by saying they have a a spiritual and emotional uh, aspect to them. He's attempting to broaden the mysterious appeal in a way that isn't factual and isn't genuine. He's, he's saying they're spiritual and emotional so that the mysterious aspect seems more profound and thus he can trick you into thinking the twist is better than it is. Mm -hmm. That's why I say it's a cop-out. It really went, and of course, of course, there's al there's also the issue that whenever you um, whenever you look, whenever you look at a at um, at his at his films with any with any sort of logic, they all they all fall apart. That's what he, makes it even more of a cop out. Yeah, and, and I, I guess the final cop out is that by by saying it, he can partially deflect some. Of the lower criticisms that aren't too well, well uh, built by saying, "Well, you just didn't connect with it on a spiritual and emotional level. You wouldn't understand." Which to to me to me that re that reads li that reads like a um, a religious apologist saying that you that you didn't read their text in the right spirit. You're essentially telling me that I that I have to that I have to accept it before I eat, before I even cover it. Yep. Oh. It, it it is for all intents and purposes a fa a faith argument, which makes me want makes me wonder why is it, why it doesn't just I would I would say <laughs> why it doesn't if he want if he wants to do this whole religious experience just go just go make a Christian movie. <laughs> he did. Is. It's called Signs. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, you walked right into that one. Yeah. I was because it's I was, all, all about a, it's all about a preacher getting his faith back. Mm -hmm. Although I'm I'm not sure if I'm not sure if it would be religious enough for the, for to to count because um I'll I'll just I'll just be frank on this one most most quote unquote religious films make me cringe. Well, I think that's signs makes me cringe. So I mean, does it count? <laughs> I. Well, I lost a bet a long time ago, and I had to sit through "God's Not Dead." Oh, oh, oh. 
You lose a lot of bets, bro. Oh. <laughs> Don't go to Vegas with that look. Uh, I'm not going to Vegas anyway. It's too damn sunny. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, there's that too. I just really you, you had to you had to watch the Kevin Sorbo movie with I, the with the really shitty straw man atheist. Yeah. Oh man. See, I'm oh man. I'm an atheist, and I take offense to and I take offense to that. To you be should. We all do. And there's there's one there's one line in there's one line in Seinfeld that I that even though and I'm, and I'm the, sh- and I'm the most chill I'm, and I'm the most chill easygoing atheist you'll ever meet. Mm-hmm. But yeah you know, yeah yeah st- but still but still <laughs> there, there's one line there's one line in Seinfeld that I keep using even though I'm not Jewish. The, when J- when Jerry's talking to a pr- talking to a priest about it, about his concerns of someone converting to Judaism for the jokes. And the priest says, "And that, and this offends you as a Jewish person? No, it offends me as a comedian. That's <laughs> that's, that's, gen, that's generally my that's generally my vibe with 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 that kind of thing. Um, but when it com- when it comes when it comes to because the the big re- the big reason why the why the idea that it's supposed to be a spiritual or an emotional ex- experience is something that I do not give the time of day to." Has a lot to do with the fact that we, that a that um that is not something that is quantifiable. It's a, it's about as quantifiable as stopping power is for firearms. Stopping power is not a thing. I really wish people would stop using the term. I mean, what term do you want them to use? Force multiplication. It'd be a start. Stopping power is just good shorthand. Let's get, let's put it that way. Yeah. The... Whereas whereas spirituality is stopping power is is it, it, as a concept does exist if you measure it in a specific way, but it wouldn't be called stopping power. Mm-hmm. Spirituality and emotionality, as a concept, is one hundred percent subjective. And because because of how subjective it is, it. Veer, it veers a it veers a little bit too close to to that death of the author kind of bullshit where at where any interpretation is valid. The curtains are fucking blue. Mm-hmm. The cur the curtains are the curtains are blue. That dress is blue and black, and 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 any other interpretation is wrong. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. But because. But um, because because of the fact that it that try that um that the idea of a emotional experience is so is so subjective that it ultimately is it ultimately is meaningless because if if every interpretation is valid then none of them are. Okay. And let's 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 also not let's also not forget that um some that. That um, people are people are far, people are far more aw- people are far more um aware of when they're be- of when someone's trying to use emotional manipulation than a lot of cynics would think. Mm-hmm. And because and because because of that. When when somebody re- when somebody realizes that there's an attempt to emotionally manipulate, they're going to be a lo- they're going to be a lot more hostile to you. For understandable reasons, you're tr- you're trying to fuck with them, so they're going to fuck back. Phrasing. Eh. Oi. Uh. And when it com- when it comes to when it com- like, and if if that's the case, the big the big question that I have to ask if it's supposed to be an emotional experience or a spiritual experience, I have to ask, which one? There's a lot. There's a lot to pick from. Yeah. You can't ju- you can't just have somebody contemplatively looking off into the distance and call it a spiritual experience. That's just that's just someone looking off into the distance. Now, if you look o- if they're looking off into the distance and there's some kind of monologue, okay, now we got something, but. That that's still not an emo- that's still not a emotional experience. That's somebody being introspective. Like 
that's the. Re- I don't. I don't. I don't give. I don't give time of day to emotional experience because it because. One, it's not quantifiable. Two, there's too many things that would count. And three, the bar for what counts as an emotional experience is so goddamn low, I can't limbo under it. I'm pretty sure Mr. I'm pretty sure Plastic Man couldn't limbo under it. (laughs) (laughs) Festival Festival rules. Two men go down, one come up. But I'd say now when it now um I do have I do have one th- when it comes to the post twist um time period with Shyamalan I do have to wonder if the fact that he had been doing these twists and doing these thrillers but not quite for so long meant that when he tr- meant that he didn't have anything to really fall back on when he tried when he tried to branch out of that like it became a crutch. Uh-huh. Hmm. 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 I th- again, I think it's. I think we pretty much already stated it. It's mostly pigeonholing, falling prey to his own hype, or rather, yeah, falling prey to his own hype. Um, uh, later, it would later become. Uh, I, I think that you know limited his sco- his scope mm-hmm. as a uh, as a, what kind of movies he would make. I mean, basically, everybody said, "Oh my God, this guy is going to be the twist guy," and then Shyamalan was like, "Hey, yeah, I go, I, I'm going to be the twist guy," and so he did, and it kind of, it only went so far for him. And then the rest of the career was all about, you know, self pity, you know, self pity, self insertion, and uh, you know, delusions of grandeur, you know, uh, impo- uh, imposed by, you know. Uh, you know this feeling of not, of uh, invalidation by people who don't who just don't get him. You know that mm-hmm. kind of thing. I think that sums it up pretty well. Yeah, and I'd I'd say um. I I I will I will be uh, as a, as as a major capstone. I would I would honestly say that people like the people like the Guardian, people like the BFI, who are trying to imply. That the people making fun of him for either his name or his twist or the like were somehow racist, ended up, end up making the problem worse. Of course. Because what you because what you're do because um, what you're doing when you're not get when you're not letting him get the you, the reason you suck speech when you're giving him an out in this regard, is you're you're giving him you're validating bad behaviors. You're giving him an you're giving him an out for for really stupid moves. And it's it's much like it's much like how we we need to, as we grow we need to have pe- we need to have people actually give us criticism other otherwise otherwise it otherwise we end up stagnating. Or if I need to use another low hanging fruit when it with this kind of thing, um. Consider consider how consider how as the years went on, George Lucas surrounded himself with yes men. Mm. Got to have some editors and some other writers to help give you perspective. Mm-hmm. Right. And when you don't have that, and when you um, when you have that, when you have this grand vision about what you're doing, when really you're ma- you're making fil- when at the end of the day you're making films to entertain. Because the the people who want something to be entertained is always going to be larger than the art crowd. You make things for the art crowd, you're going to get art results. That being not that many. If you if you want if you wanted to if you wanted to cry me for being cynical about it, I'm not being cynical. I'm being truthful. This is the reason why every every attempt to make a art to make a art game for for a large audience will always end up failing. Hi, Last of Us Part Two. Fuck you, Cuckman. Huh. Thank you for reminding me of Last of Us Part Two. There was a meme, vi- uh, meme image I saw going around uh, where they took the punching and choking scene from that game and pasted it over some famous mecha pilots for some reason. Um, was one of the pilots Char? Nope. Hmm. It was Ryoma. Punching zero two, while Simon was watching from the distance, and I don't know why. 
and it, <laughs> it made me crack up so much earlier that that's, uh that's i couldn't breathe oh I wow couldn't breathe oh, i saw I it and, and just how how out of place it was i just couldn't breathe uh right. I, I i i don't get laughs like that very often so uh and, and jelly <laughs> I find the art again, I'll post it in council. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to. Uh, but with, but I think, I think that, co I think that covers everything. And do I, do I have high hopes for old? Not really, because for starters, um, Buddha only closes his eyes three times, and um, I'm a little, I'm a little too skinny to qualify as Buddha. <laughs> Second. Well, technically, well, technically, it depends on which Buddha. If you're going with like Indian Buddha, we're, we're talking thin. We're talking, we're talking thin. If we're talking like Zen Buddha, we're talking fat. So, uh, in fact, Buddha was actually made fat uh, during uh, one of the Chinese dynasties in order to uh, symbolize a uh, prosperity and uh, wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, because you know back then. If you were fat, it means you had a lot of resources and a lot of, you know, and and you had everything that you need, and you had ever, more than what you than anything you could need. Yeah, I hear. But, yeah, I hear. I hear that. I hear that. Def, I hear that being used as a, def, as a defense from people who from people who um are, who really who really need to lose a few pounds and refuse to. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Indian Buddhism or Japanese Buddha or Japanese Buddhism or like even certain Zen Buddhisms, Buddha was Buddha was skin, Buddha was lean, mm -hmm. Bu Buddha was lean, oh. and, and, but he had, but he always had big ears. He always had big ears. <laughs> yeah, but the point the point is is that um the pr the problem is he the problem is Shyamalan has made has made too many mistakes and he has and um even even something like Split Split. The the most charitable thing that we've said about Split is that it's not terrible, which is a damning statement if you ask me. Hmm. That's that's why I, that's why I, it, that's why I it's asked. Half, it's halfway to being good. It's halfway. Yeah. Mostly on the mostly on the strength of its actor. But but um the big the big problem is that kind that kind of that kind of halfway to being good is not good is not good enough for a redemption arc. And the big question that I ended up asking, regarding it being halfway to being good, is: is that true? Is that one hundred percent the case, or is or is there a recency bias? You know, beca because there, because there have been film after film of absolutely terrible, but seeing something halfway de seeing something halfway decent is is like a oasis in the desert. Hmm. Um, and I so don't. What, I don't have an answer for that personally. What's the question? Sorry, I, I didn't get it. It's it's less of it's less of a question and more of a ponderance. Um, whether it is whether or not um, whether or not split is actually good, or if or if we were or if we were just um, or if we were putting putting it on a pedestal because because it wasn't as terrible as what came before. Uh, my ultimate. Um assessment was that he didn't push far enough with the slasher stuff mm -hmm. and it could have been great otherwise do you th do you think that that whole must be must spiritual emotional experience may have helped may have held him back from going all in no if it had been must spiritual uh must spiritual emotional experience he would have gone further in and he also would have given it more religious overtones In this case, I think I think it was just he didn't want to make it icky. Yeah, there's that. I think I think if there's two lessons to take from when it comes to this is that one, the worst thing that the worst kind of creative that you can be is someone who is someone who thinks that they're making art. Oh, and two. You if you if you're trying to please everyone, you will ultimately please no one. I think I think those are two good um co two good codas. Yeah, definitely. Um, but with but with that with that said, I think I think th I think that'll be it. That'll be as good as as good of a spot as any to um 
to put to put the, to put the fu to put the final um final part final part in the in this sort in this sordid affair looking at looking at a unfortunate looking at an unfortunate director um next the final week, nail in his coffin as it were yeah it's mm -hmm. kind it's kind of funny that we it's kind of funny that we start we started this month with a coffin and we're continuing this month with a coffin okay but, but next week next week is go next week is going to be fun <laughs> Ooh, what do we got what do we got don't what spoil, do we got, don't spoil it yet, but that is that is going to be a story for the for the eighteenth. Um, obviously, I will not be doing Geek Watch on the twenty fifth because I'm not because I'm not setting I'm not setting this up remotely. Neither will we be doing Valley of the Judged on the twenty third. Mm -hmm. Essentially, uh, the monastery is going on hiatus between the twenty third and twenty sixth, guys. I think I think I will have a review queued up. For the twenty fourth, and that's it. But I have, but I have no, but I have no plan. I have no plans on doing it, on doing anything beyond that. That said, um, we do have an event in the server on Wednesday the fourteenth. That's going to be where we're going. We're going to be converting the original plan that we had of the E three hangover special into a watch party. I did con I did convert the watch together playlist into a regular YouTube playlist and we'll be fun, utilizing fun. that. Fun fun just don't share it over uh Discord anymore and your and your computer won't die. Yeah. <laughs> um that's <laughs> Yeah, that that is that is unfortunate. I'll, pro I'll probably uh, I'll probably ask somebody else to carry the to carry the load when it comes to screen sharing for that for that particular one so we don't have um surprise sudden death. I can probably do it. Yeah. Uh, but and of and of course I of course I've got a I've got a few I've got a few interesting return returning guests and few and few and and some surprises com some surprises coming in the next few days. Al along with along with along with glorious glorious shit posting. Of course. <laughs> but until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk and join the watch. <laughs>